Hey, I'm Ryan, and welcome to The House. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us from all around the world. And we hope more than anything that you might find hope and life in learning about the person of Jesus. If you're looking for additional information about The House or just for more resources, you can find them online at thehouseonline.ca. Thanks for joining us today, and enjoy the service. Hey guys, welcome to the house. Why don't you guys head this way and we're going to get started.
good evening. Welcome to the house. It's so good to have you here tonight. Uh, my name is Ryan. I serve on the leadership team here, and uh, we're just so glad that you've chosen to spend your Sunday night with us. We know that you could be doing a slew of other things, maybe that you should be studying, uh, but that you chose to be here, and uh, we think God wants to do something special this evening. Um, I, I don't know what your week was like, but um, I, I seem to always have interesting weeks, and uh, right now I'm in the middle of renovations at, at home at my house. And we are framing two by four walls and insulating and ripping out drywall. Uh, And I I love renovations because uh, you get to take something that is, um, well, ugly, not nice looking, uh, and you get to work towards making it nice. But for me, what's so frustrating is that you have this plan and this idea and a timeline, and this is what it's going to look like, and here's how it's going to go, and I'm going to get those walls up, and and it's going to just look awesome. It's going to be beautiful. And what ends up happening is you run out of two-by-fours, and you don't get the right amount of drywall, and it takes six extra days, and uh, it's just not ever quite the way that you imagine it happening. And I think for for me and for many of us in in our spiritual walk and and what we experience with God is much the same in that way that um, we have an idea or an anticipation of what we would like it to look like, what we would like our relationship with God to look like, what we would like His work in our lives to look like. And oftentimes that looks different than we would like it to. And it's hard and we can't fully understand, but I love the hope that Philippians 1 verse 6 offers. It says this, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You know, maybe you feel a little bit like you're under renovation right now and that it's not going the way that you would intend it to, but I am confident, I am confident that God, the God that we serve, through the person of Jesus has the perfect plan for your life and we'll see it to completion. He's not going to leave you halfway and that we can find hope in not knowing all of the plan but knowing the person who's carrying out the plan. And so that's what we're here to do tonight. We're here to know the person of Jesus, to connect with our Heavenly Father and we just want to find hope, joy, and life in the person of Jesus tonight. So why don't you bow your heads with me We're going to lift this evening up to the Lord. Jesus, we're so thankful, so thankful that you're in the business of renovating, God, that you have promised to carry out the work that you're doing in our lives to completion. Lord, we know that we're in desperate need of your help, that on our own we can't do it, that we aren't good enough, we don't have enough, and we'll never be enough, but in Jesus we can find that that you've made us fully complete, fully right, fully whole in the person of Jesus. And so tonight we want to worship, we want to praise, we want to make a whole bunch of noise. Lord, because you're worthy, you're worthy of it all. And so, Lord, we're here to do that tonight. We pray you'd be glorified, that you'd be exalted and lifted up above all else. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen. This next song is called All Hail King Jesus, a new song by Jeremy Riddle. And I just love the words, um, just recognizing that, that Jesus, that God himself came down and humbled himself um, among us. He, he saw us from up there and he wasn't, wasn't a God who was just going to look down on us and see us suffer and say, look at those pitiful people. But he actually came down and suffered amongst us and um, went all the way to the cross just for us. So uh, I just love this song. All hail King Jesus, the Savior of the world.
not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens were
surrounding me, let him breathe at your name still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every way at your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the dark. Your name is a light that the shadows can't 
All right. Well, welcome to the house. Great to have you with us tonight. And uh, it's such a good opportunity to get together and uh, worship together. I want to welcome you if you're with us on our streaming audience. We, we also have the live stream going. Uh, people at home and uh, throughout the week are watching that. And we want to welcome you as well. Um, I like that video of uh, communicating the different aspects of Jesus being the light of the world and different parts of him. Of course, being in the Christmas season and the Christmas decorations and things up, uh, all those things are emphasizing and reinforcing that Jesus is the light of the world. My youngest daughter, Ava, loves everything about Christmas. And uh, there is, uh, like somewhere around uh, the August long weekend, she starts to put on her Christmas Santa hat, and she starts to sing Christmas songs and gets it in her heart. And uh, there's very little that uh, kind of captures the, the Christmas uh, kind of theme than, than the lights. And so every time we get in the car... Uh, my, my little daughter, Ava, is like, Dad, can we go look at the lights? And we can never just go from, from you know, point A to point B. We always have to drive through different neighborhoods looking at Christmas lights and kind of, and she's like, like you know, checking it out. And um, there's something about it that just grabs her. And I don't, I don't, you know, I appreciate Christmas lights, but not with the same level of enthusiasm uh, because there's a dark side to Christmas lights. And if you've ever put them up, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, you risk life and limb and stretching on ladders. And, uh, you know, for, for me, there's, uh, there's something that's guaranteed in my life that, that uh, as, uh, the, you know, the Christmas season comes and we all get busy and there's different things going on. And it seems like I'm, I'm looking and waiting and waiting to get that, that one free night where I can finally get the lights up. And, uh, you know, I go out to the shed and I get them, bring them and start stretching them out and get out the ladder and start... It is always like the coldest night of the year every time that happens. And uh, when I'm done, I can barely, you know, kind of move my hands and I'm frozen. And uh, I, I grew up in Saskatchewan. That's part of the reason I live here is so that I don't have to do that. And, uh, and so there's something about that. And um, I remember a couple years ago when we switched to the little LED Christmas lights. And I went to put them up. We had been using the, the kind of the old school ones that have like a hook behind each bulb. And they just went up so easy and so fast. And the LED ones, are just, they're just on their own in the big string. And you have to put your, you know, kind of clip on your own hook. And, and so I remember doing it like, you know, a couple. And I thought, well, this is going to take forever. So I just did one every like 12 lights or 18 lights or whatever kind of thing. And, you know, kind of snapped them all up. And I stood back and I looked at them. And I went to the edge of the driveway. And it was dark by that time. And I was already feeling kind of cold and chilly. And I remember looking at them thinking, oh, it looks pretty good. And uh, I started to put the ladder away. And my wife, Angela, who's like awesome, and I uh, love her, and she, she came out, and I could tell, like, she didn't share the same level of enthusiasm for my Christmas light job, and she kind of, hmm, hmm, she didn't really say too much. I said, what's wrong, honey? Don't you like the way the new LED, the color, you know, they have a little bit of a different color, and, you know, don't you like the way the red looks on them? She's like, no, no, the color's fine, and I said, well, are, like, are they not big enough? Are they not bright enough? And she's like, no, no, you can definitely see them. And uh, I said, well, what's wrong? And she said, and this is where, like, she, she dealt the fatal blow. She said, and she, she pointed across the street at my neighbor Doug's, and she said, how come they're not nice and straight like Doug's are? And I looked at Doug's, and this guy's Christmas lights are freakishly engineered, like perfectly straight, like one inch apart, all pointing in the same direction, all the way along the front of his house, up, down, all around. And then I turned around, and I looked at mine, and they were just, like, pointing everywhere, and, uh, and I was already frozen, and I looked at them, and I knew that I would be redoing the Christmas lights that year. And so I had to get the, the package of those clips and then meticulously put on each individual light and line everyone up and get them all perfect. And now every year when I'm doing the, the Christmas lights, it's like a bigger, like takes forever and that's part of, the, part of the package. And so Christmas lights are not all they're cracked up to be. And um, it's believed that the tradition of Christmas lights is traced back to the 1700s when Christians would put a candle, a lit candle, they would, they would burn a candle in their front window of their home. And especially in the colder climates where the windows would kind of frost over, uh, when the candle was there, it would, the, the warmth of the flame would, would keep that part of the window defrosted. And, uh, and, and as it, it kind of, the, the, the flame uh, spread out, the, the ice would get thicker and thicker as it moved away from the flame. And it would illuminate and send this awesome shadow and, and the, the glow. And it was really to communicate to the outside world that this home was a safe place and it was open to all who had need. 
And it was done under the, the, the same kind of idea as the, the star in Scripture, the, the star that guided the Magi to find Jesus. And it was to say that this home is where Jesus lives. You, you come here, if you follow that light and you come here, you're going to find the love of Jesus, and this home is open for all. And that's actually the, the, the tradition of where the, uh, the idea of lights at Christmas comes from. And light is an important theme throughout the scripture. And it actually begins with the first step of creation. Think about the story of creation, of God working, the narrative of God showing up and, and beginning to create the world and humanity and all that we know. What's the very first thing? He says, let there be light. And so the very first marker, the very first movement that God puts in to the creation story is to create light. That's the very first reference. That's the very first way he shows up. And all throughout Scripture, we find that there's, a, there's the metaphor and the meaning and the kind of prophetic references to light and the purpose of light. And it really ties in as a, as a connection to God. And in John 8, 12, Jesus says this. He says, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Now, Jesus is making a very bold statement. And in order for us to really understand it, we have to know and understand what's going on with Jesus and right there in the time, right in that moment, what was happening and what was going on. You will often hear me talk about the importance of understanding the Jewish worldview and understanding the culture of Jesus' day in order to take the full meaning of the things that Jesus is saying. Because Jesus is ministering and teaching within a Jewish culture. And so when we understand more of what's happening in the Jewish worldview of the day, we can understand at a deeper level the nuances of what Jesus is really teaching and what he's communicating. And so light held significant spiritual meaning to the Jews because it symbolized the incarnate presence of God with his people. It began in the creation narrative, and it shows up in multiple places throughout Scripture. And in particular to the Jewish people, the story that they held dear to them, the story that had incredible significance to them, is a story of, of, of Exodus, the Exodus story of when they are leaving captivity in Egypt as a people of God and entering into the promised land. And so Moses leads them out of captivity, and God sets them free. God, God delivers his people from captivity. They've been held captive for some 400 years. And God sets them free under the leadership of Moses, and two things happen. They actually receive freedom. The people of God receive their freedom from two things. They receive their freedom from physical slavery. They'd lost all their land and all their rights They'd lost all their freedoms in Egypt. They were treated harshly. They worked in the harshest of conditions and environments. They provided all of the hard physical labor that built up the entire Egyptian kingdom. And they were uh, mistreated. They were um, marginalized. They were ostracized. They were condemned. They were ridiculed. They were, they were a, a people that were loathed. And so when they are set free... From captivity in Egypt, they are set free from physical slavery. But they're also set free from spiritual slavery. And this is part of why it's such a beautiful story to the Jewish people, because they were, um, they were having their children born in captivity and growing up in a foreign land with foreign belief systems and pagan beliefs and different kinds of gods and different kinds of, of belief systems, and they began to infiltrate the Israelites and they're living in this foreign land, and they're beginning to take in little bits. It's, it's like we do in our culture today where we, we live in the, the faith in Jesus, and, and we hold to a Christian faith in Jesus, but it's hard, and the, the world just seems to kind of get in, and little bits and attitudes and things creep in, and they, and they begin to kind of lead us astray. And what happens is the, the Israelites are living under a spiritual slavery. And when God comes along and he says, I'm going to lead you to the promised land, there's going to be freedom. It's not just freedom for them to work their own lands and create their own living and have prosperity and blessing and, and to be free in that area, but it's also to be free to worship the one true God. And so this is the freedom that they get. And the promised land is much more than physical dirt. It actually is a whole new way of life. 
And so the Exodus story is really close to the hearts of the Jewish people. And when the Israelites leave Egypt, they're on the run. It happens very quickly. They have very little in way of supplies and preparation and resources. They're fleeing an army that's chasing them down. And as a result, God helps them out. And this is interesting because they, don't, they know they're going to the promised land, but they don't even really know where it is or how to get there. And in Exodus 13, 21, 22, it says this. It says, The Lord went ahead of them, and he guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. And this allowed them to travel by day or by night, and the Lord did not remove the pillar of uh, a cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. So God sends a pillar of fire in the sky to light the way at night. This is significant because it shows the people of God that their God is with them, that their God is still there, their God has not abandoned them, their God is leading them, their God is guiding them, their God is present with them, their God is caring for them, their God is watching over them. And it not only shows them themselves that their God is with them, but it shows their enemies that the Hebrew God, the, the God of the Israelites is alive and well and he's there with them. And without the pillar of fire by night, they can't see. They're in the wilderness. It's, there's no lights. There's no street lights. There's no flashlights. They don't have LED keychains. They don't have an app on a phone with a light. They have, they have no, they're, they're on their own. And so the pillar of fire has far-reaching significance for the people of God. When I was a poor Bible college student, my car was far from a reliable automobile. I had a piece of junk car, okay? And uh, I remember heading home to see my parents one weekend from school. It was late at night, and uh, I was flying down the highway, and I was all by myself, and my lights went, and they, they cut on, on and off. And my heart just like, ugh, because I'm like at highway speeds, and it just went, and then it came back on, and then flashed a couple more times, and I was like, oh. And all of a sudden, they just went, they just went dead. Total, like, totally gone, like no lights at all. Now, um, if any of you have ever driven on a barren stretch of highway in Saskatchewan in the middle of the night, you will know that the 100 kilometer per hour posted speed limit is just kind of a suggestion, okay? And so I was going at a pretty good clip, and it was not, there was not a bright moon out. There was not a clear sky that night, and so when I lost my lights, there were no street lights, there were no, I'm in the middle of nowhere, and it's just black, and I'm going like way over 100. And so I like jam on the brakes, and you know, I manage not to hit the ditch, and, and uh, I stop on the side of the road, and my heart is racing, I'm panicking, I'm, trying, I'm looking at everything, I can't figure out, They're, the fuses are all good, I have my lights sitting, and my, my, my hazards, my flashers are on, I'm sitting on the side of the road, and a semi comes, you know, down t- from the other direction, and the guy stops, and and he says, do you need help? And I, you know, I explained my situation. He says, well, there's, a, uh, there's a, uh, a town about 10 miles ahead of you. And so I figure, well, okay, I'll, I'll do my best to get there. And so I get in the car, and, and I start, I'm just, I'm kind of like looking out. I figure as long as I don't see wheat on this side of the car, I know I'm still on the highway. And so um, it's about 10 miles. Well, it takes me forever, because I can't go fast, because I can't see a thing. And um, I finally pull into this little town, and it's, it's called Radisson, okay? Not the Hotel Radisson, it's just the town Radisson. And um, this is before cell phones. Like, you, you, you guys were born with, like, a cell phone in your hand, but um, this is, like, way before. And they had these things called pay phones. And, um, and so I found a pay phone on the side of the highway in Radisson, and I called my big brother, who came out to get me. And uh, when he came out and he found me, uh, he just put his lights on high beam and went down the highway, and I just came and tucked right in behind him, and I just followed right behind him. With my, and as, as long as I was close enough, as long as I, I got up in behind him, I could see with his lights, I could see where I was going. And he led the way, and, and I got home that night. If it wasn't for him coming, and if it wasn't for his headlights, and maybe, I would have had to spend the night in my car, sleeping in the ditch beside Radisson. And um, waiting until the, the lights came up and the sun came up the next day. And then I went, and this is the same for the Israelites. They're in the wasteland, they're in the wilderness. And there is no way they can move with all of their, without this. And, 
And not only is God showing them the way, but God is showing them that he's with them. And it is significant meaning to the people of Israel. It's a significant part of the narrative. And what happens is, scholars would tell us, is that um, when they eventually would stop at the end of the night, they would set up a tent, which was the tabernacle. They, they, they physically would stop and they would set up a tent to be the tabernacle and they would put the tabernacle right underneath where the pillar of fire was in the sky. And then they would encamp all around it. And they could still perform the priestly duties and they could still provide honor to the Lord. They could still glorify God, thank him for being the pillar of fire at night and the God who is with them. And they could still, they would center their whole camp. There's a great metaphor in there of them centering their lives around God. And the next morning, the cloud would appear, and they would pack up, and they would follow the cloud. And then as soon as it got into darkness, the pillar of fire would come, and they would do it all over again. And this is a significant part of the story of Israel. It's this part of their understanding of God that they held dear. I'm going to get the the band to come. We're going to get ready to to close down tonight. But um, when Jesus proclaims that he's the light of the world, When Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, you don't have to walk through darkness, and if you follow me, I have the light that leads to light, this is where it gets really interesting. Jesus does this when he's in front of the temple. He's in front of the tabernacle, he's in front of the temple in the courtyard. And he gives this declaration during the Feast of Tabernacles. So guess what happens in the Feast of Tabernacles? In the Feast of Tabernacles, they have a large table, priestly table at the front of the tabernacle with a huge candelabra, the ceremonial candle, and it's lit during the Feast of Tabernacles to represent the pillar of fire of God showing up and leading his people through the wilderness. And it is the ancestors and it's the people of God that gather to commemorate and to remember and to worship God and to thank God for bringing the pillar of fire to lead their people through the wilderness and through the darkness. And it's when this is happening that Jesus stands in front of the temple and he says, it's me, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world that leads you through the wilderness. It's not just about your ancestors and what God did. It's about me. And this is amazing because Jesus does this right after he talks about the woman who's caught in adultery. See, as Jesus is teaching in the temple courtyards, they bring this woman who is caught in adultery. She's guilty. And they bring her before Jesus, and all the men are ready to stone her. And they say, Jesus, what should we do? And Jesus says, how about you who are perfect and without sin? you be the first to throw the stone. And one by one, they begin to put their rocks down and their stones down and they begin to kind of grumble and humble and they kind of back away. And eventually Jesus says, where are your accusers? And the woman says, they've all left. And Jesus says beautiful words. He says, neither do I condemn you, neither do I accuse you. And he says, go and sin no more. And he offers this forgiveness to this woman who is caught in her adultery. He says, go and sin no more. And guess what the very next sentence that Jesus gives is? The very next sentence is, go and sin no more. He says, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you don't have to be alone in the darkness because my light leads to life. And what Jesus is telling everybody in that courtyard and everybody around and everybody who's coming into the temple is is in the same way that God showed up to lead your ancestors through the wilderness and into the promised land and into a new life, into freedom from physical and spiritual slavery in the same way that God showed up and provided the light for them. And you're sitting here commemorating and remembering this in the same way. I do that for the whole world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The whole world. In the same way that God showed up, I am here to be light in your wilderness. 
And there is a sin problem and a sin issue in our world and in our culture, and it's all of us are born into this. All of us are guilty of this, and there is nothing we can do on our own to get out. It's like being in the wilderness without a light. You don't know where you're going. You don't know how to get out. There's nothing you can do on your own, but Jesus comes as the light. He is the light of the world. And what he does is he just says, I know the way. Why don't you just come and tuck in behind me? Why don't you just follow me? Why don't you just let my light lead the way? And I'll provide a way out. And that way out comes with his forgiveness and his love and his grace and his mercy. And it's a beautiful part. It's a beautiful component of who Jesus is, especially as he's telling this Jewish culture, this Jewish crowd. He says, I'm the light of the world. It has very big significance to the listeners. And this is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is the light of the whole world. He is not just for one tribe or one culture or one people. Jesus is not just the light of the world for Christians. He's the light of the world. There's an invitation for everybody, for everybody to come to him. Every race, every nation, every people group. He's the light that shows up in our pain and our darkness, and he lights the way for us. When he looks at that woman who's caught in adultery, she is brought forward. They're ready to kill her. She is caught. She's full of shame. She's full of fear. She's full of guilt, sorrow, dysfunction. And Jesus shows up in her darkness. And he's like, here, follow me. I'm the light. I can help you. And you see what happens is we so often think about Jesus as the the light that leads to life. And we think in terms of eternal life. And we have what we we focus in our in our church culture today very much on like kind of an atonement work where we we think that all the work of Jesus is just for the salvation, just for the afterlife, just for the saving of our sins and, and finding heaven in the afterlife. But the truth is that Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly. And the actual the, the whole wording in the Greek when it describes salvation and being saved really means restoration. Jesus didn't just come to save us from our sins, to provide us with an afterlife. He came to restore and repair and be present in our life to give us abundant life. He came to bring us forgiveness and love and healing. He came to bring us courage and hope. He came to bring us direction and provision and all the things that we need to to live an abundant life in Him. And when we follow Jesus, when we hold on to him, when we tuck in behind him and let him lead the way, he leads us to those things. He leads us to an abundant life. Jesus is the light of the whole world. I wonder if maybe we could just pause in this moment as we often do and just kind of have a moment of reflection and a moment of just kind of opening our heart to the Lord. Maybe this is something new for you. Just kind of participate along with me if you just sit with your with your head bowed and your eyes closed and just think about just think about Jesus think about is there is there peace with Jesus is there a place of belief for him in your life maybe you've thought about him as the light but you haven't really opened your heart And there's an opportunity, there's an invitation for every person to know Jesus as the light of the world. And maybe tonight you would like to make that that invitation, that that request, that that openness of your heart to Jesus. And you can can do that very easily by just putting your hand up and saying, Jesus, that's me. I want to ask you to be the light of my life. Make that kind of commitment. And maybe this is a great night for you to, maybe you've been thinking about it and this is a great night for you to respond. I wonder how many would say, yeah, I need to to ask Jesus to be the light of my life tonight. Why don't you just slip your hand up for a moment so I can pray for you. And perhaps you're here tonight 
And you know that the, the light of Jesus, the love and the grace and the strength and the courage and the, the hope and all those things that can be found in Jesus, that they haven't been as evident, they haven't been as present in your life. It's kind of like Jesus had been leading you down the highway and you didn't quite keep up and you kind of slowed down and he got ahead of you. And, and tonight you'd say, you know what, in this, in this season, I want to be close to Jesus. I want to ask him to come into the darkness and the, the cynicism and the, the stuff in my life and bring his hope and bring his life again. I just need to reconnect with Jesus. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe you feel like you drifted from Jesus. But tonight you want to say, Jesus, I want to just reconnect with you. I want you to be the light in my heart. And I wonder if that's you tonight. You just slip your hand up so I can pray for you. Yeah. And so, Jesus, for those that put their hands up to say they want to welcome you and, and, and invite you, Lord, into their heart and into their life to be light. I pray that you would do that. And Jesus, for those that put up their hand and said they want to reconnect with you and they want to welcome you again and welcome your light into their life, I pray, God, that you would, you would do that in this moment. You would be present with such great love and encouragement and hope. And Father, I pray that you would help us all to remember that with all the Christmas stuff and all the lights and all these things that Jesus, it really is a way of celebrating you as the light of the world. And just as Christians started so long ago in the 1700s to put a, put a candle in their front window to say to the outside world, this is a safe place. God's love is here. Jesus, I pray that we would be able to do that in our lives to the outside world around us. Those friends and family that we will spend time with, the people we will be with, Lord, I pray that you will help us to be light and to be love to them. And for those in our community that feel alone and feel discouraged, I pray, God, that you would just love on them. I pray that your light will fill their home and their heart and you will just surround them with your presence in a beautiful way. And they would know that they're not alone. And Jesus, that you are with them. We pray that you'd strengthen this community over the next couple weeks as people go away for exams and go back home and take a break over Christmas and that, Lord, we, we ask that this would be a place that we would glorify you and celebrate the light of Jesus in our midst. In Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with us today? Sure, appreciate you being a part of our, our service. We're going to just sing a song together, and uh, we'll officially dismiss in just a moment. Together worthy, all together one. 
with us this evening as you go uh, if you want to be a part of the house and, and worship in a financial way we want to let you know you can do that uh, underneath the scrabble board at the back online through text messages um, just so many ways that you can get involved in, in worship in that way a few things that are going on in the life of our community here in the next week on Friday night if you're a, a young couple or if there are two of you who make up a young couple, uh, Sarah and I, my wife, are having people over Friday evening doing just a bit of a social, a time to hang out, get to know some other people that are in a similar stage of life. Would love to have you join us for that. All of the details are on the internet at thehouseonline.ca, and uh, it's going to be a really, really great evening. Um, next Monday, the 18th, we are uh, doing our final of the year House Helps Outreach. And this is our, our way as the House Sunday Night Service to uh, just give back to our community, to be involved in, in reaching beyond the four walls of, of the house here in our city. And so that's Monday night, the 18th. And we're going to head downtown, hand out some hot chocolate, and just pray for people and say, hey, we uh, believe in the hope of Jesus for you in your life. And so lastly, 
as you go, I want you to know this week there is no student lounge. In fact, no student lounge until the new year. And so if you are used to getting soup on Monday and Tuesday evenings for dirt cheap, uh, you're going to have to wait until next year. Um, we're done for the year. And so don't, don't come tomorrow. You'll be alone and it will be sad. All right. So as you go, we live in this world that desperately needs the hope of Jesus, that desperately is in search of, of a light. And as people who, who believe in the hope of Jesus, we have the greatest hope to offer. And so as you go into school, into your exams, into your workplace, whatever your life might look like, um, why don't you bring a piece of Jesus? Why don't you be Jesus to those people? And I don't know exactly what that looks like for you because what it looks like for you is different than what it looks like for me. But I know that it's gonna take some intentional effort on your part. So as you go in your world, why don't we be Jesus? Be a person who makes much of Jesus and points people towards Jesus. All right, I'm gonna pray for you and then we're gonna rock and roll. We're out of here and we will see you next week. So Lord, thankful, thankful for how you equip and use your church. Thankful that the church isn't something that happens on Sunday night in a small warehouse, but that the church is a group of people empowered to bring the hope of Jesus to the world. And so. Lord, we pray that, that our world would, in the season of Christmas, above all else, be pointed towards you. We would be pointed towards the hope that can be found in the person of Jesus Christ. So God, we love you. We're thankful for what you're doing, thankful for what you've done, and eager to see what you've yet to do in our lives. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your name. Everyone said, amen. Well, have an awesome week. We will see you next Sunday, uh, if not before. Uh, go make God look good. Like how you're still practicing over there. <laughs> Working hard even after the performance. <laughs> Good playing. That was awesome. Good on you. Good job, guys.